I'm not sure how this works. Hello? Hello, it works. Yay! So, um, just, I'm, I'm Dan Shearer, I'm from various places. Uh, I, I learned about contributor agreements and, and stuff from um, open source projects. Uh, I work for a small not-for-profit company called Emerge Open, uh, and I'm from Australia, from Scotland, and, and monkeys. So, um, contributor agreements are mostly things that uh, don't work very well. If you, um, I was able to find about 150 examples, including some very, very obscure ones, uh, and most of them are astonishingly bad. Uh, some, some are, are, are quite effective, and some of them are just confused. So, um, we'll, we'll try and have a look at some of the, the details here. But the first thing is, it's a little bit like the notion of intellectual property. If you have copyright, and patents, and trademark, then they call that intellectual property. Now, these things are closely related, like a fish and a bicycle. Okay. That absolutely nothing to do with each other. And that is the first problem about many contributor license agreements. It confuses things that have no relationship to each other. So what I'd like to think about is what are the motivations? That, um, the talk we had uh, from INRIA just before about the really cool medical stuff was quite good because there was some understanding of the motivations why are we going to do things in a certain way, and that might be a business, and then what happens over time. And a lot of people don't do that. And I suggest we try and separate out the different components. So if there is uh, something to do with the origin of the source code, that's not the same as a license agreement. Okay, so uh, this means thinking quite deeply about what we're trying to do. Uh, now, the other thing is that today's source code is not the same environment as it was even just five or six years ago. And so we have modern tools that change everything. All right. So it's about contributors. And the business people won't understand this. But contributors are actually quite rare. They say, well, open source code and Everybody puts in lots of contributions. Um, in fact, it's only a very few projects that have contributors coming in uh, from the outside to a large percentage. There is a core of contributors usually, and then all the value is in very small contributions. In fact, sometimes you have a project where all of the external contributions, that is people who are not previously associated with the project, are less than what is regarded as the minimum required uh, of about 10 lines of code to be significant. And so you never need any agreement, you just don't even think about that. Um, so the contributors are not the biggest issue. Your biggest issue is things like, do you have a business model? Maybe not. Great. What is your long-term view for this code? Legal issues may be um, technical strategy, that sort of stuff. And the users, your end users, won't have a clue about contributors either. They never do. Okay. So looking at the just the global environment as well, there's some stuff about code that makes a difference. Now a distributed source code management, that's like Git and Mercurial and these others, but, but Git's the big one these days. Everyone knows about Git, do they? It's uh, source code management. Um, Gabriel? You, yeah. So um, I like to think of Git as a distributed file system, because that's what it is. It's just a great big file system where everything has a date and a time and a user and a unique ID, and you can always identify that forever. And that is critical, because it makes the copyright tracking side of software much less of a problem. And the lawyers, they, they go crazy saying, oh, we don't know where things come from. Well, actually, today we do. 
we know exactly where it came from. Um, good coders will tell you they know where it's going to. So that's the first step. Um, a lot of contributions using plugins and other sorts of interfaces. Interfaces recognized under EU law, incidentally. Now that makes a big difference. Because if you have a technical project where we have lots of business logic for the main core of the project, and then somebody can do a, a, a plugin or a loadable module or something like that, then quite possibly we look at the people doing the modules, maybe not really as contributors, maybe we don't have to make life very difficult for them as opposed to somebody in the core. So just think about what we actually want wanting to apply these contributor agreements to. Maybe we can limit the scope and therefore limit the pain and the hassle and make people go away less often. The thing about development is a lot more about the society, the, the talking about stuff. A lot of business people, non-technical people don't understand. It's not so much the lines of code. Um, and of course, money actually if you're really worried about the status of some few hundred, few thousand lines of code, actually, not very many euros can just fix that. Usually. Not always, but usually. And there are people who will argue for years about the copyright status of 2,000 lines of code. Wow, 2,000 lines of code at current market rates? Not very many euros at all. So it's often good to think about how you can just cut away problems and keep your problem space nice and small. Okay. So it's all about thinking in the code, right? Social interaction. Yeah. Calling in the lawyers to help put a document that helps social interaction, don't think so. Not a good match. So what we need to do is have the minimum scope possible for this thing. All right, so there's, there's more context here. There's a big difference between an open source project and open source code, and I hope everyone in the room is familiar with that. Yeah? Okay, so I won't bore everybody with that. The contributor license agreement, if there is one, is all about code, whereas actually the most important thing is the project. So if you say stupid things in the contributor license agreement that hurt the project, then your code isn't worth anything anyway, and so you've just wasted your time. And there are some classic projects that have made that mistake. Um, and th these agreements can really cause issues, serious issues. Um, well, uh, from time to time in this talk, I'll mention Sugar CRM, which is a PHP application for, 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 for business purposes, um, which is kind of like the classic case of how to do it really badly. Um, and, and that really hurts the project, has definitely stopped people contributing. So, uh, is your license agreement going to establish your business model, the contributor license agreement? Well, if it is, then you've made a mistake. Because you're, if you have a business model, and not everybody, every project does, of course, look at the projects that I work with, they certainly don't have business models. They enable business models. But if you do have a business model, Please don't start with your contributor license agreement. That's the wrong place to start. A business model starts with business discussions. Um, whereas a lot of people say, well, if we have a really broad, a very strong, very restrictive <coughs> contributor license agreement, then we can have all these business models in the future, which is a real problem. Okay, so yeah, they can help. They can help. I'm not going to say they're all bad, because they're not. But you have to watch. Okay. The other thing that everybody forgets is about time. Time makes a big, big difference to um, the, the life cycle of code. So um, I'm often working with people who have functioning code that is very important to them, which is 30 years old. Now. This code is very important to some people, but its general commercial value is zero. And yet, often this code 
is under conditions that were imposed 25, 30 years ago that make no sense today, but they're permanent, they're fixed. So think about that. Stuff changes a lot. Your code still may be used generations from now when there is no issue of commerce whatsoever. All right. Um, now, the other thing is we have a very fast changing environment in terms of, of patents, uh, and a somewhat changing environment in terms of copyright. And so you have to be aware in your license agreement, contributor license agreement, that these things will change. And maybe you can kill a project by not having enough flexibility. Okay, so that's probably enough general stuff. Why do people want these things anyway? Okay, because they want to keep it safe. Wonderful. It's always good to keep open code safe. But do they really? Because actually, what a lot of people want to do is say, well, I can use this thing to make money sometime in the future. They can never use it to make money now. Not, not really, because the contributions haven't happened yet. So this is very speculative. Um, and I guess the other motivation for having a contributor license agreement is because people are terribly confused, uh, which is not, shall I say, a good motivation. Okay, so people who want to keep the project safe, that's, that's fine. Um, I'm very sensitive to keeping projects safe. Some of you may have heard of the European Court of First Instance um, case in 2007 when Microsoft went against Samba, uh, which is my project. And that was very, very scary. We had some huge lawyers, uh, huge lawyer firms, I should say, trying their hardest to shut down a project uh, to harm the individuals involved and to damage the companies that have built businesses around this project. It's really serious stuff. Now, the interesting thing here is that a cons contributor license agreement normally tries to consolidate copyright. Everyone familiar, understand what we mean there? You do a copyright assignment, you say, right, I have a project if I make a contribution, then I give that project 100% of the copyright, but then I keep 100% as well. That's uh, a non-lawyer's way of putting it. Andrew, is that good enough? I'll do. Thank you. Uh, we have a lawyer at the back there, by the way, if you need someone to kill, as they spoke. <laughs> um, so this is the idea, you see. Um, it all sounds fair. I contribute some code. I give these people 100% and I keep 100% for myself. But the trouble is, I'm only contributing maybe a fraction of 1% to the total code base. That's not really any use to me. I can't do anything with it. Whereas the people that I've given the code to have the total of the contributions. And so the, one of the classic cases here is my SQL. Um, and I guess most people here know what happened to that. The idea is one company controls all of that and they have something to sell. And in their case, Sun came along and bought it, and then Oracle bought them. So non-consolidated copyright, do think about this as an option. It's a way of giving very strong protections. Because they can't run around and contact each of us. It can be a problem. So a few years ago, you may recall that the Mozilla Foundation had to contact all of the contributors because they wanted to do a license change. That's a problem. On the other hand, the only reason that Samba won the court case was because there were individual copyright holders. And it wasn't, uh, th that court case was very, very significant. You're gonna see a, an announcement for Samba 4 very soon now, which is a full implementation of Active Directory. And that was only possible because we won the court case, and that was only possible because we did not do copyright assignment. So there is a, you have to consider the, your specific case. Okay, so can we keep the um, project safe from external patent threats? Uh, no. 
Nobody knows how to keep projects safe from patent threats. There are things we can do to reduce the risk, but actually nobody really knows about patents. For a start, software patents in, uh, in Europe have a very different status than they do in Japan or the United States. And that's constantly under review. And so basically nobody knows how to give proper protection. All we can do is reduce the risk. Okay. And the, there are, so the idea is if, if you get coders, uh, contributors who really don't understand anything non-technical, if you make them sign a document, then that means that they are behaving. Possibly. All right. So this is, in fact, the big one. The thing about a contributor license agreement with copyright assignment to some uh, organization that is not benevolent is because they want to have something to sell to a venture capitalist or to some large company that wants to buy you. It also gives you a point of control because if you make someone sign an agreement that says things like, for example, uh, I will never exercise my patent rights against you, which some of them do, and Sugar CRM goes even further, then you are taking away the possibility of a contributor to defend what happens to their own code. Sugar CRM goes so far as to say, if you own any patents, you automatically give them all to us. Quite interesting. Okay, uh, and, and the, con the contributor license agreement is a very good way of shutting down a project. Now, why is it that MySQL hasn't been shut down? And the answer is because of the license that's been chosen, uh, because of the GPL. But they've tried, every, Oracle has tried every other possible avenue to destroy that project, uh, with some success. Thankfully, there's an alternative. Uh, I have no bias in this matter. All right, so there's lots of silly things. Um, people use a contributor license agreement to make a wonderful statement about how, how this, this project is here for saving um, humanity or being the best medical imaging, something or other. It doesn't belong there. The coders don't care. That's policy. Policy is somewhere else. Um, the indemnification. Are we everyone cool with the word indemnification? Yeah? Yes? No? Cool. Um, there is this idea, especially in the United States, that if you make all of the contributors sign the right piece of legal document, then you get more customers because the customers will feel safe. Uh, the idea being, remember when there was a, a branch of, was it Fujitsu, went around with lawsuits saying don't use GIFs on the web? Remember that one a few years ago? Unisys, thank you very much. Uh, so the idea is if you have the right contributor license agreement in place, that won't happen. Um, go and talk to some lawyers. Basically, this is rubbish. It just makes no sense at all. Uh, how to behave as a group, you know, please be nice to everybody on the mailing list. It doesn't belong in your contributor license agreement, but it's in a lot of them. I love North Korea. I really love North Korea because apparently uh, the just a couple of weeks ago, they said they found proof of unicorns um, in history. That describes so many contributor license agreements, and I, 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 mean, I don't want to embarrass them, but we can bring up the text for some of them. They're really silly. Okay. So we have a statement of origin in Samba and a few other projects. This is different from a license agreement. The statement of origin simply says, I promise that this is my code. I have permission from my employer, if that's relevant, to contribute this code. Uh, and one or two other simple things, I think there's five points. Um, this is really good. There should be no debate at all that certificate of origin is a good thing. Combine that with a source code management system like Git, and that gives us 100% history of where something came from what is its status and what happened to it through mergers and changes and maybe mergers with other code in other projects and all this sort of thing. It's a good thing. Consider taking that away from your contributor license agreement. 
it'll make it everything simpler. Uh, and this is very good indemnification. If anybody wants to talk about indemnification, say, hey, the best thing we can do is know absolutely where all the code came from. And then somebody, somebody always says, oh, what if a really horrible person from, from Microsoft or something uh, comes along and contributes code that they know is going to uh, have a legal problem? The answer is, that's against the law. You can't do that. So if somebody breaks the law, then they're bad. We can't write anything to stop people being bad. Another thing to avoid is explicit statements about patents. It's really difficult. Nobody knows what's happening with patents. We can minimize the risk. You can fill whole rooms with lawyers talking about patents. Um, think about maybe a license that addresses patents, but don't put great detail about your patents in your contributor license agreement. It's just confusing, it makes people go away, and it's probably not going to be relevant a few years from now. We know that the patent system is very likely to change. It may take 20 years, but there's huge forces for change. Consider joining OIN, the Open Invention Network. Has anybody heard of this at all? I don't know. Yes, some, some, great. Uh, so this is a huge advertisement for Open Invention Network. Um, so the OIN is a really good idea in the same way that nuclear weapons are a good idea. Um, if everybody has a nuclear weapon, then the idea is everybody's safe, you see. So if you join OIN, it's a promise between all the members, which includes some companies with massive patent portfolios like IBM, that if you don't attack them, they will not attack you. That's not a bad promise. In addition, there's not some promises, but there's some expectations that if somebody attacks OIN, it could well be that some of those big members will go and attack them back. So um, that's one thing you can do to reduce your risk, and it doesn't at all belong in a contributor license agreement. But I see these things all the time. Okay. Patents are hard. I just talked about that. Um, one thing, there is just one thing. So if it's appropriate for your project, GPL v3, even in Europe, even in France, does speak about um, patents. And all I can say to people who say, oh, but it's not valid in France, is, well, there are some hundreds of expert people spent years on that patent section. And if you think you can come up with a, a better answer than them, Good luck. Uh, I don't think it's likely. That includes people from companies who make all their money out of patents, as well as people like Richard Stallman, as well as French commercial lawyers. So just be thoughtful. Consider reading that GPLv3 in the patent statement as one of the best compromises that has been found in modern times. OK, so a contributor license agreement is basically about copyright. Throw away all these other things, all the patents and stuff that says I'll be nice on the mailing lists. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it. Uh, Ubuntu um, and Fedora have uh, agreements where you promise to be nice. And they're, they're good, actually. They're a very powerful thing. That is not a contributor license agreement. This is what we're about, mostly, in this talk. I hope Gabrielle is now starting to be happy with me. So the, the point about copyright in a contributor license agreement is either for money or it's for protection. It's all about control, right? So um, if I'm a contributor and I sign an agreement with an organization, the point is there's some trust in here. Am I trusting them to do the right thing with my code? Or at least... I'm hoping it's not too bad. And this, this, this is the big deal. Um, for money, you're not going to trust them. Do you really? I mean, if, if you need any convincing, just look at my SQL, which is like the amazing poster child of why you would never trust somebody in a contributor license agreement, ever. OK, so what kind of control? Changing license terms in the future, which basically says, uh, right, the world has changed. Either I want to make more money, 
So I'm going to make everything proprietary, and that's what Inria said is one possible model for some of their spin outs. Fair enough, okay. Uh, at least you're honest about it. Um, another is to say the world has changed, and I don't know, patent law has changed, and so we need a new license. We need a Mozilla License 17 or a GPL 4. The contributor license agreement can say, okay, at the option of the project, we will now change everybody's license to be GPL4, Mozilla 17, or whatever. Uh, you don't have that freedom if you haven't signed a license with each of the contributors. Um, and there's all these things about protecting. But the first two are the really important ones. The ability to change the license terms. Unfortunately, most of these that I see in the real world forget about time. Remember I talked about time in the future, where time, time earlier, where the value, the commercial value of code diminishes very quickly, even though it is still useful to a lot of people. And so in these clauses, where you're talking about the ability to change license terms in the future, it's very important to remember those facts about how things change over time. Okay, so an asymmetric contributor license agreement. Uh, so that's when I give them all the power and they give me back a license to my own few lines of code. That's totally asymmetric. Um, you, can, you will never trust anybody like that. I've never seen anybody trust them. They do it for people enter into these agreements for pragmatic reasons. You might, and many do, contribute their code to an independent institution. Uh, it could be the Apache Foundation, for example, um, which isn't, doesn't have very high demands. And they do promise, for example, about patents. They promise never to use the rights you've granted them against the interests of Apache people, Apache users everywhere. They're a not-for-profit foundation. There's a lot of credible people there. Um, it's not likely to die soon. Probably that's an honest, reasonable statement. And then, of course, there's the specialist software institutions. I mean, Apache is a specialist. I guess I mean specialist um, free software ones. And we'll speak about them in a minute. These organizations can do an awful lot for you. There's some really scary stuff. Um, for example, is everybody aware that the United States courts claim universal jurisdiction? Yeah? So, some idiot judge in the United States had a copyright case, and he decided that if this was software that was used in the United States, what someone did with it overseas could be decided in a U.S. court. Andrew, is this fair? Uh, yeah, sort of, <laughs> but carry on. Am I correct? Okay, I have to be very careful here because I'm, I'm making a legal statement, right? Yes. Am I correct anyway to say that U.S. courts claim universal they jurisdiction? Often, they often claim universal yes. jurisdiction. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So for a technical person, that's good enough. Um, that means what United States uh, law says about your code written here in France actually does matter. And there is a stupid thing called copyright registration where United States copyright is not fully recognized unless you go to the United States Library of Congress and register a printed copy of your code with the uh, Library of Congress. It is completely insane. However, if you wish to have good protection for your code written here in France, you want someone to do this for you. That is what is one of the services of various free software institutions. Think about it. They will look after it for you. A lot of the free software projects that have been discussed today, I suspect, I checked on one or two of them, I suspect have never had copyright registration in the United States and are therefore somewhat vulnerable without knowing it. That's what happens if you get lawyers who don't really know free software well. Um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I've just been scared too often. Okay. So, examples of institutions that will do all this crazy stuff for you. Um, 
the Free Software Foundation Europe has a thing called the Fiduciary Program, um, where you've assigned them copyright using a contributor license agreement, and you can just see it online. That's a really interesting process to go through, because they don't accept every project. And they help you do a risk assessment and give you a score out of 10 or something for your risk. Um, it could be that if you are very low risk, for various reasons, it, you don't even need to think about it. Um, copyright license, uh, what is it, contributor license agreement. Uh, so that, that is an interesting thing about doing, uh, interesting thing to do. Their goal is